The rest of you could turn to John chapter 18. Love you, brother. Praise the Lord. When you affect one person, you affect a lot of people. By the way, in case you all didn't notice, you know, I've been talking about all this garbage stuff that's been happening for a long period of time, but um, out of the um, new laboratory study out of Rutgers University, are you ready for this? Now there's two different studies on this, but you can look it up yourself. And this came from Rutgers University. They did a big study on this whole COVID thing in a laboratory setting. You ready for this? There are two things that they absolutely know that will dilute and put a stop to COVID in a person's system. Are you ready for this? In a laboratory setting, Listerine, the mouthwash and chloroxidine literally disrupted the SARS COVID-2, the virus that caused the COVID-19 within seconds after researchers diluted it to the concentrations that would mimic actual use. <laughs> you guys, when universities are coming out with their own studies, when they can actually see what happens right in front of them, I hope you realize what we just went through. But there's the... There's the studies. And all of these studies pretty much turn out the same, but they're never allowed to get on main media. So, but let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you. We praise you. We love you. We ask, Lord God, that again, we would keep it real and raw. Our lives, Lord God, do not need to be hypocritical or phony or, Lord, it needs to be to where every single one of us, Lord God, just fall on our knees in front of you and say, Lord, use me. All of us are headed to hell without Christ. And so, Lord, thank you for coming. That's what we're going to be talking about today. May you be blessed, Lord God, by everything that's said and done here for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 18, starting with verse 37, we're dealing with Pilate and Jesus. But I want to talk today about why did Jesus do what he did to people like us? You know that there is nobody in this room that deserves salvation. Not one person in this room deserved heaven. If you think that you deserved heaven, you are not going to be comfortable in this church. Okay? Okay. You're not. I am no different than any one of you that are sitting in there with a good Samaritan shirt. Part of the conviction and the vision that the Lord put on my life was because I recognized the hypocrisy that was in the church. And I recognized the hypocrisy in people's lives. I absolutely love Jesus. I'm not perfect. And I figure if the Lord can forgive me, then the Lord can forgive you. And he can save you. And he not just saves you, he actually restores you. Amen. You won't have to worry about it, Bo. He's restored you. Billy, he's restored you. Didn't take long. When you come in humble and you say, I'm useless without you, Lord. You're only a vessel that needs something inside of you called the Spirit of God. You're just a vessel. You're a hunk of skin running around. Think about it. But you are you because God miraculously, fearfully, and wonderfully made you. You are all the apple of his eye. You are beautiful and precious in his eyes. You can't erase a freckle. You can try to scrape it off. Get a little knife when you get home and scrape off a freckle. And you know what's going to happen? It's coming back. You're going to look when the skin grows back. That stupid freckle is back. Try to, try to scrape off an age spot. I know people that have tried. Anybody know what they look like? I can show you. 
I can show you. Okay, Darlene, if you'll allow yourself to just. <laughs> you can try to scrape them off, but you know what happens? They come back. Why? Because God knows who you are and he keeps you who you are. It's all the molecular structure that God made you with. You can't change it. God has something planned for you. In John 18, 37, it says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Obviously, that was a sarcastic question. Jesus answered, Well, thou sayest that I'm a king. To this end was I born. And again, I'm going to get to the actual cause and the reason why he came. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I unto this world. And he's about ready to tell him that I should bear witness unto the truth. There was a plan that was out there, and Jesus said, I had to become a part of that plan. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Talking about Jesus, verse 14, the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Here he is. He's standing right here now. And he says, the reason that I came is so I can bear witness of this truth. Well, later on, or no, before that, he said what? I am the way. I am the truth it's interesting the I am's being in there everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice so he came to bear witness of it Pilate said unto him this is one of the most important questions that are ever asked in scripture what is truth if I ask somebody in this room what is truth what is truth what is truth everyone will come Maybe a little bit different, but you're probably going to round it up because we're Christians. You're going to say, well, Jesus. I'm going to say, that's good. Very good. So, who is Jesus? It's easy to say the truth. Do you understand how deep this gets really quick? So, who is Jesus? If you understand Jesus, if you accept Jesus, you understand Jesus. You have something inside of you that you absolutely can't even hold on to. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's crazy ridiculous. He wants to do incredible things in your life. He came for you to be incredible. He said, I came to bear witness of this. And Pilate said, what is truth? What is this truth? He was looking right at him. And the neat thing, and I talked about it in the first service, is they were, you know that they were looking into each other's eyes. Are you a king? You say that I am. I came to bear witness of the truth. And as they were still looking into each other's eyes, Pilate says, what is truth? And immediately, when he looked in his eyes and he saw the essence of Christ, the eyes of the what? The windows of the soul. When he looked into those eyes, he walked away. Right then, right then, he walked away and he says, I find no fault in this man. <laughs> because why? He knew. Pilate knew. Now, the forces were against him. All the forces that were out there were against him. But when he looked at him, he knew. Oh. What is truth? And as soon as he asked that question, don't you know that looking at Jesus, he walked away going, I think I just saw it. I mean, I find no fault in this man. Wash my hands from this one. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders that were out there, they said, crucify him. Crucify him. Let the sins that there, let them be upon our hands. Whoa. 
a bunch of arrogant, religious church people. God have mercy on all of us. I appreciate your testimony, Sean. I don't care whether or not you're rich or poor, whether or not you're famous or you're not famous. We all come into this the same way. And unless you humble yourself in the eyes of the Lord, you will never be picked up by God. It's a broken and a contrite heart that recognizes that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God bless you, my brother. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out. Again, he walked up to who? The Jews. To all the religious leaders. And he looked right at them. I know he did and you know he did. And he saith directly unto them, I find no fault. And listen, no fault at all. At all. At all? Wait a minute. Let's talk about that at all. Okay? Michelle, if I got you up here and said, could you explain that to me? Find in him no fault at all. What he's saying is, he looked into the eyes of that man that was right there, and he couldn't find one fault in his life. Not one. Everything that he had heard. And he knew right then, there's not one fault in this man's life. You have accused him of all of this, and yet I stand here and I know, I know that I know that I know there is not one fault in this man's life. I, I couldn't say that. <coughs> Could you say that about me? Talk to my wife. <laughs> what did Jesus hope to accomplish when he came here? You see, the cross means a lot to me. Do you know how many crosses right now they're taking off of churches all over America because they're offensive? They're taking them off. Uh, you know how you're driving through a city and you see a cross up on the side of a mountain and you kind of, it just really touches your life. Yes, somebody here still believes in the cross. I hope if you got a piece of property, put a big lit up cross right on it. And then you'll have a whole church to back you up when somebody says it's offensive. You know what's offensive to me? When you ask me to take down the very thing that saved my life. <laughs> Wouldn't it be insightful to know the expectations of Jesus by going to the cross? What type of expectations did he have going there? Did you expect me? I mean, if you went on the cross and you died on the cross, what did you expect out of me? I mean, wouldn't that mean I have to, like, work for something? What do you expect out of me, Lord? You know what the Lord would tell all of us today? Nothing. Nothing, really. And you know the reality of what he just said? It's really nothing. He doesn't expect you to do nothing. That's why he placed the Holy Spirit in you because you're absolutely worthless without something that is holy inside of you to do something that is good. He says you have no good inside of you at all. Only God is good. So what does he expect out of me? Nothing. That's why he said, I got to go. But when I go, I'm going to send you a comforter. And that comforter, that comforter is going to just put your life in a radical position, brother. That comforter, the only thing that comforter really does is he comes inside of your life and he lets you know you're going to another realm. You're living in another realm. You are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And only the comforter can let you know that it's only by the spirit of God revealing that to you that you even know it you. see I know I'm really not of this world and that could get you shot <laughs> and neither are you if you're a born again believer we're kingdom minded if you're a born again believer 
were Jesus-minded. Five times in the book of Matthew, Jesus specifically says why he came. I'm going to give you those five reasons really quick. I said really quick last service. It didn't go that way. <laughs> so really quick. If I was a judge, I have a little gavel in my, in my office. If I was a judge, I would lay down the gavel like Jesus did. Because in Matthew chapter 5, 17, it says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, I'm going to take that in a literal sense first. Because the law and the prophets in Scripture are Moses and Elijah. Moses being the law, the actual Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Viticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses is the whole symbol of the law in Scripture. The prophets, Elijah, is the symbol of the prophets in Scripture. And if I were to ask you, really, what happened to Moses and what happened to Elijah? I could tell you they were not destroyed. So one, they were not destroyed. He said, I ain't come to destroy the law. Well, then what happened to the symbol of the law in Scripture? Moses. Moses went up to stand right in his presence is what he did. That's why God at 120 years old, his eyes were good, his strength was good, his legs were good. Otherwise, how are you getting up the mountain? Everything about him, his strength was all good. And he said, I want you to go up the mountain and die. I'm on it, man. I'm on it. Why? Because before that, he had already asked God. Well, I've talked about this to, you, to all of you. You know, he, he asked God, let me, let me see your face. God said, you can't see my face and live. So he went up there to see God. And that's why in Scripture, he's the only one, he said, I spoke to Jesus face to face as a friend. Or actually God <laughs> is making, making the reference. So him and Moses spoke to each other face to face as a friend. When? So he didn't destroy them. He took them home. He brought them straight home. Now let's talk about, let's go further than that and let's talk about, he says, I, I, I did not come to destroy but fulfill. So all of the Torah, all of the Pentateuch, all of the Tanakh, every bit of it was all about one person, Jesus, the Messiah. He said, I didn't come to destroy any of it. And it's still, by the way, it's still today, it's totally in operation. And a lot of people try to say, well, you're not under this and you're not under that. No, no, you need to understand. He came to fulfill it. He didn't say he came to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. So if he came to fulfill it, I did not come to destroy anything. By me going there, I fulfilled everything that the law and the prophets even talked about. The law and the prophets are always those. You find those two are the ones at transfiguration. Those are the two that are standing before the Lord of the earth, even in Revelation. So you have Moses and Elijah that are there. You find two witnesses that will come back. And it actually defines them in, in uh, Revelation chapter 10. It defines them by the miracles that they actually did. I didn't come to destroy them. I didn't come to destroy anything that they prophesied or anything that the law was about. I am it. And that's why it's very comfortable for him to say, I am. <laughs> he just is. That is so radical to me because he is. Who is Jesus? He is. You said it right. Well, who is Jesus? Yes. <laughs> well, how do you know? Look at me. Look at you. Look at Mr. Dalton. Look at Mr. Sternberg. Look at, look at, look at Stephanie. Look at Royce. You would not be who you are without the presence of God in your life. So he says, I didn't come to destroy any of that. I did that to fulfill everything. Why? Well, why? Why couldn't you do it from another place? Well, that's really easy. Because in order for that to happen, we had to have something descend. And it had to be absolutely perfect. It couldn't be flesh and blood because flesh and blood would never inherit the kingdom of God. And so how does this take place? Well, that's easy. Let's talk about it. Whatever descended and came into this thing is the only thing that's going to ascend. 
And so if Jesus came, then the only one that's getting out is Jesus, according to Hebrews. So just think about that for a minute. Well, then we're all burnt. Yep. Except he did come. And it's interesting because then he walked up to David later, okay? And he said, well, David, he says, I want you to understand this. You are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Just like a marriage. It brings the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, trying to give the example. When the two become one, well, you're not one for crying out loud. You're a guy, you're a girl. I mean, I know they're confused nowadays, but there's still a separation. And he looked at David and said, you need to understand that. Well, why? Because the only thing that came down, that's the only thing that leaves this dimension. Otherwise, it'll absolutely destroy you. Anything outside of God is hell itself. And so, you need to understand that the only thing that's leaving is Jesus. And so the particles even know that, if you want to get into string theory or particle theory, but the particles even know that. And so all of a sudden, here we are, we're just looking at David, and David's going, well, what does that mean? Am I burned? Well, no, David, you need, uh, you're not getting what I'm telling you. You are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. You see, if I'm living inside of you, then you literally are the body of Christ. I had to come because you got nothing to get there. You got nothing. He came to give you access of making it out of a world physical dimension into a spiritual, outrageous, incredible creation that he did for you. It's out of this world. You couldn't imagine it, but he had to come and he had to die here by your hands. So the gavel was laid down, which means all of you are guilty. Every one of you. There's not one of you that wasn't garbage. Now you think about it. Is that offensive to people? Because God will work on you. <laughs> if I went up to Sean earlier and said, man, Sean, come on, man, you're garbage without Jesus. He'd, God, are you kidding me? Who are you, Tim? Who are you? I say, serious, man. You want to sit down and talk about it? I have no time for you. In reality, every single one of us were on our way to hell. And the Lord stopped everything in motion and said, I got this. I got this. We're coming up to Resurrection Day. Next week, we're going to be having our missionary from China that's going to be talking to you, and he's going to start this process of the resurrection. So I hope you come. The next thing that he came to do in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13, it says, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. John, he didn't come to call the righteous. And all of the righteous people that are out there, all the goody two-shoes, all the businesses that think that they have all the character that they need. He didn't come. He says, I didn't call. I, forget it. Because if they're righteous, let them be righteous. <laughs> he said, what I came to do, I came to grab the sinner. And you know, sinner and saints are used as opposites in Scripture. So a lot of people say, you know, I'm a sinner saved by grace. You need to be using that as a past tense. Because if you're still a sinner, you're still in trouble. You need to say, you know what? I was a sinner and I got radically saved. I'm born again. I have the Spirit of God that lives within me. How do you know that? Are you serious? You overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your... It's my testimony. I was lost and now I'm found. I was ugly and now. And in verse 14 says, Then came to him the disciples of John saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off? But the disciples 
fast not. How come you guys are fasting? Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Do you know what he was saying to them? It's like, whoa, come on now. He said, but the days are going to come when the bridegroom is going to be taken from them, and then shall they fast. In other words, got to go. Got to go. No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment. And then here he's describing what I just tried to describe to you. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. It's, it's absolutely going to blow. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Also the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. You can't be who you were and receive what he did. You have to receive what he did and become who you are. Does that make a difference? The old man, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. A new creature. That's right. Ladies don't like to be called it, but you're creatures. From the Black Lagoon. <laughs> I could just see you crawling out from the water. <laughs> You're a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. Not some things. All things. All things. I want to remind you that he found no fault at all. And yet... He bore everybody's sin right after that occasion. Think about that. And that's the only time when he was on that cross and every bit of your sin was upon him. Do you know what? Striking his back with a cat of nine tails until it ripped apart like an animal's flesh coming completely off him. You couldn't recognize he was a man because there was nothing left on him. They pulled his beard until literally when they pulled the beard, they pulled it like this. They didn't go poop, 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 and pull out hairs. They pulled it like this, which means the surface of the skin would have easily ripped when they did that. And so they pulled it off of his face. They whipped him with the cat and nine tails until his back was raw and just meat hanging out of him. And you could not even recognize him. And that must have really hurt. But the thing that hurt him wasn't that. The thing that hurt him, listen to me carefully. The thing that hurt him, was bearing your sin, Rosalie. He took it. Was bearing your sin, Stacy. 2,000, over 2,000 years ago, Tony, he bore your sin. He took it. He took it. And he made a point of not just taking it, but destroying it. He destroyed the work of the enemy, it said. Destroyed it. You go, well, if he destroyed it, why is it so prevalent? Because we don't want it. We don't want righteousness in our lives when we're having fun, when we're out in the world. He found no fault at all in Christ. And once you get saved and the Holy Spirit is in you, now guess what you're striving for? Spotless. No spots, no wrinkles, no blemishes. You stand before the Lord as the bride, and you are adorned as his bride. And do you think he doesn't have the ability to take the pimple off your face? <laughs> the next thing is he draws a line in the sand. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth because that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants peace in their life. John, you're not going to have a lot of peace in your life. If you're a born again believer today, you, you think now for some odd reason you're going to have peace in your life on the outside. Your peace lies within you now because the peace on the outside now, devil hates your guts and don't think that he ain't going to come after you. But guess what? He can't have you. Why? Because it was already done. And listen to what the scripture said and what we need to believe. Think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. You know, the sword is offensive. 
When you're off doing whatever you want to do, all I have to do is walk up to you and say, whoa, you shouldn't be doing that. Who are you to think that I... <laughs> And it's, by the way, the Bible doesn't start within this body necessarily. He starts within a family unit. And that's, that's what he addresses. That's what he addresses. It's almost embarrassing. For I came to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. You're going to have enemies now because of the sword. He that loveth father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. He that loveth his daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. What kind of a God, we ask ourselves, what kind of a God would tell us that we, we can't love our, wait, time out, he didn't say that. He said you can't love him more than him. Or it's idolatry. It's idolatry. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now let's look at this for a minute. What happened on the cross? See, there was a sacrifice. He gave it all. And it says here, he that doesn't want to give it all. That's picking up your cross. That's what happens on the cross. He that doesn't want to give it all. And you don't want to follow me isn't worthy of me. Do you want to give it all? I ask you that question because it doesn't come easy. The church, we've had it way too easy. Spoiled what? Rotten brats. That's what we are. We're a bunch of spoiled kids. I imagine if you put us together with the underground in China, put us together uh, with Ethiopia, Put us together with, and they'll look at you like, spoiled little brats. What is wrong with them? They talk amongst themselves as Americans. What is with them? Why is it that they don't appreciate the small things? Why is it that they come over here and they're bored? Why is it that they come over here and blah, 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 blah? Because we're spoiled rotten, folks. That cross was not easy for the Lord. Why would it be easy for us to be the church of a living God? He gives you peace from within, but your life is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, acceptable unto Him. So that is your reasonable worship or your reasonable service. That's just reasonable. We haven't even got to the hard stuff yet. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses, loses his life for my sake, shall find it. You want to find life? Then lose yours. You say, well, that's, you know, let me tell you something. It was very difficult. Justine is like a daughter to me. She's just a beautiful person. But Justine didn't want to do what Justine does. She didn't want to do that in the beginning. And I don't want to embarrass you, Justine, but she didn't want to do it. She goes, ready for this? I don't like women. I don't want to live with women. I'm sick of living with women. All of you have been in prison for a while or jail for a while. You're sick of it. You don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do this. Okay. Um, but Justine... The Lord's called you to do it. <laughs> okay. Justine now is a part of the responsibility for over 3,000 souls. Amen. But you see, here's what had to happen. And periodically, we all go through this whole thing again. Because our flesh still gets the best of us. But let me remind you of something. Need I say any more? Pick up your cross. Well, I've done this a long time. Pick up your cross. Well, it's really hard. Woe is you. Woe is you. I don't feel sorry. I don't, I, 
why would I feel sorry? The Lord is trying to just whoop up on you. Why would I get in the way? He's trying to stop you from your own flesh. He's trying to stop you from your own pride. And he's trying to tell you, I told you to pick up your cross and just follow me. Why me? Do you really want to ask that question? And do you think you would if Jesus were right here right now? If Jesus said, if I'll use Justine for the example again, and Justine said, Lord, it's hard. Why me? Justine would never ask that question to the Lord. <laughs> if the Lord were here right now, she would say, Lord, thank you for putting it in my heart like you did David. Make me to know your wisdom in the deepest parts of my heart. That word make me means force me to do what I need to do. And Justine has been in that position for 18 years. Anybody that ever meets our secretary always says the same thing. She's like, where did you find her? She's like the best thing in the world. She's exceptional. I am the most important person in her life. You and everybody else. And you're right. You are because she loves you so much. But she was a 90-pound drug addict that I believe that was abused all of her life by men. Living in a place she shouldn't have been living in, doing things she shouldn't be doing. You didn't see her when the Lord was crying for her. When the Lord was calling his bride, wanting to know when Adela was going to make that turn. And when the police officer said, you either need to go into this program or we're going to arrest you, then that's when I got the call. I showed up and I knew right then, mm, man, Lord, you know how to pick them. <laughs> She's beautiful, is she not? And yet there are times, oh, that woman answers hundreds of calls a day. Johnny and I, we average 70 to 80, but not her. She's over the top, three at a time, and answers all of your questions at the same time, and got a bunch of people at the window going, yeah, 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 hello, 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 answer my question, answer my question. And by the way, a lot of those are the same people that are there all the time. And then you got the one that just sits in the office because they're friends. So how you doing, Adela? <laughs> I tell her, shut the door. Don't let him in. I can't do that. I really love him. And I really... You know what? There are times that she just wants to break. But do you know who keeps her there? That cross right there. If Jesus went there then why are we not going there? You see, it's not hard anymore, is it? He drew a line in the sand. Whosoever findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Some think of Jesus as this Mr. Rogers kind of a guy who just wants to just be there for the neighborhood. It's another day in the neighborhood. <laughs> But let me tell you something. Jesus is a God of war too. And don't think that he's not. Do you know, well, that may be another sermon. I'm not going to go there. And then the other thing, number four is a raft in the ocean. Matthew 18, 11. Unless you have a revised version, they took it out. You can look at your Bible to see if you still have Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. But it says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. That means the Messiah came. Not is coming still, although he will. But he came to seek and to save that which is lost. How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep 
than of the 99 which went not astray. Well, you're going, what? That doesn't even make sense. These guys were loyal. These guys were true. These, these sheep stayed in the pasture. These sheep, you know what? Then that are forgiven much are going to love much. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It's not God's will that any of you should perish. And yet, according to the stats, a few will make it. You know what that means? God having the biggest hand in the world, they use it for a table that's full of rocks or marbles. Okay, there's another thing that they call them. Uh, but I can't remember what the word was, the Hebrew word for that was, but... And then you fill the table, this table full of marbles. And then you reach down and you grab as many marbles as you can in a hand. That's a few. Few will enter. Why? Tell me why. Tell me why. You see, wait, let, me, let me remind you. He went to the cross. Where are you going? When it says to pick up your cross and follow him, it's the sacrifice of your life. Go. What are we supposed to do? Be fishers of men. Be fishers of men. I want to remind you of this. If you're, by the way, if you're stuck in the middle of the ocean, why is it that people that are stuck in the middle of the ocean say, it's okay, I'm saved? <laughs> I leave people that do that. I really do. I, well, <laughs> your family's a, le a wreck, your life's a wreck, and everything. What do you... Well, I received Jesus when I was 12 years old, and I'm, I'm doing really good now. I've just been an addict ever since, and a pervert, and I've been, you know, horsing around. I also drink on the side, but, you know, that wouldn't be bad if I wouldn't lose all of my money in gambling. But you know what? At 12 years old, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I'm doing really good. Well, the only thing I have to offer you is Jesus, since you already have Jesus... Good luck. Good luck. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying you must be born again. Finally. The next thing that's going to be really serious is you're a slave on the auction block. And being a slave on the auction block, according to Matthew 20 and 27, it says, Whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Isn't that cool? Many are called, but few are. So he gave his life a ransom for many. But here, here's where we are. We're up there, and we are slaves, and we are on the auction line. They're checking out your teeth, your strength. I wouldn't even, I, nobody would buy me. Look at me. How about that guy? Nah, he's all shot up. His teeth are bad. He's ugly. He's got a belly, can't even raise his right arm all the way up. We can't use him. Next. But then here comes Jesus. Yeah, I'm shot up. And I'm not the person I used to be. but I've been bought and paid for. Amen. And I wasn't worthy and you weren't worthy. He walked by and he saw me there and he looked at me and said, you know what, that's not what I need. You see, all the outside may look good. The white sepulcher that is there looks good on the outside, but the whole inside is nothing but He looks at me and he says, Tim, the outside doesn't make a difference to me. He'll take a shot up man that looked at his life and thought everything was going to be over. 
And he said, Tim, I'm going to pick you up. And I'm going to still make something out of you. Are you willing to go here? Lord, I'll go there. Billy, go there. Kevin, it's all or nothing. Todd, there is no going back. I don't need to talk to you. Because he loves you so much, man. You've got a calling on your life. He loves the youth. Get it now, Bo. All or nothing. All or nothing. We are a slave on the auction block. And whenever you think that you are not worthy because you're better than, how dare anybody use me as a slave? Shame on us. You know how many people use Good Samaritan just to get out of prison? Praise the Lord that when they finally get out of prison and they come here, they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It opens up their lives for salvation. I'm going to end with this. Not because I'm done, but because I need to end. Hebrews 2 and 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Thank you, Lord. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death. That is the devil. Do you know what he came to do? He came to destroy the only thing that hindered you from getting there. He destroyed him. He destroyed him. You say, well, how come I still feel him? You need to understand by faith, he destroyed him. And if he destroyed him, what are you doing? That means you can't say the devil made me do it. You can't say it. Why? Because Jesus called you and destroyed him. So the devil didn't make you do it. You chose to do it. No more excuses. No more justification. We either pick up our cross or don't pick up your cross. But make the decision because it's salvation itself. Last but not least, to destroy the one hindering you from getting what you really need. God has emotions. When you say that God has emotions, I can go through, he gets angry, he loves, he has compassion, God grieves, God, he, he has to laugh, look at you. I know he laughs. I hear him laugh more than I hear. It's a weird relationship that I have with him. He laughs. He laughs at me more than anybody. I hear the word. Everybody goes, you got to be careful because stupid is offensive. If stupid is offensive, then stop saying it to me. <laughs> because I hear it all the time. I'm not kidding you. I hear it. Tim, that was really stupid. <laughs> what are you doing, stupid? <laughs> and I'm just, okay, Lord. You see, he has a, he has a great sense of humor. Yo, I'm going to, this was, this is my next study for you. I'm surprised I ever thought I could cover this in one sermon. My next study with you is going to be the emotions of God. Because you need, you need to hear that he's just like us. He loves to laugh with you. He likes you to get in the privacy uh, somewhere just with him and have conversation with him. Joe Daniel, I love Joe Daniel. I love Johnny because we get in these places to where we can talk to each other and say, you know what? What's a God telling you? Oh, you're not going to believe this, man. I was out on the hill the other day. I went out there just to be with the Lord, and this is what he did in my life. And I'll, well, this is, this is what he's showing me. And he, you know, I was going to do that, but then the Lord said, no, that's stupid. Why would you do that? And he laughs at me. Lord, I can do that. He goes, no, you can't. You're all shot up, Tim. Stop it. I say, Lord, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. <laughs> he goes, don't go there. Would you bow your heads with me, please?
we're in a place today. Oh, I love music. (laughs) We're in a place today where the Lord is just telling you, listen, you know and he knows whether or not you've actually picked up your cross. You can get tired of the burden, and that's what we're here to do, is to share one another's burdens, one another's loads. We can do that. But let me tell you something. Most people have not picked up the cross. You say, I've tried to pick it up, but it's too heavy. Oh, that's, that, that is where Christ comes in. Pick it up. Pick it up. Follow him. These altars are open for you to say, Lord, I acknowledge that you're talking to me. I acknowledge that I need to pick up that cross and I need to make the sacrifice to be able to do that which is righteous and that which is good. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, we have an annual business meeting. The members are going to come. But you know what? We don't, we don't make any decisions that are outside of God. I refuse to do it. We're not going to do it. God, what do you want? This church will only survive if Christ is in it. If Christ isn't in it, I'm out of it. What about you? Where's your life for real? I'm not the judge. God is. But you know where you are. And you know what you have to do. If you're a youth today, I want to speak directly to the youth. And I don't know why I'm doing this, except I believe the leading of the Lord. If there are youth here today, you know where you are with the Lord. And you know how hard it really is. But you know what? God's calling you. You're special. You get to be probably one of the last generations to be able to see the coming of the Lord. And you need to shout louder than any generation that God is real and that Jesus is coming back. And if you're youth here today and you say, you know what, Pastor Tim, I want to do that today. I don't know who you are, but I know that there's somebody that's trying to listen. And I pray that if if you're listening, I pray that you would say, Pastor Tim, that's me. I don't care what my friends are saying or what they want to do. As for me, I'm going to pick up my cross and I'm going to follow him. And if that's you, then I want you to come. I don't want anything to hold you back. Don't look at the person on your left or right. We don't care what they think. It's you. You can come and you can put your head on these stairs. And mom or dad, aunt, uncle, one of our deacons will come with you. But I believe that there's people that are going to be anointed today and young people to be able to get a hold of Jesus. I'm not, I don't want, I don't, I'm not the kind of guy that puts pressure on people. I, I can't stand that kind of stuff. It either has to be God or not. But if you have a conviction in your life, don't sit in your seat. Your family will never come together and do what God asks you to do until you are obedient to the Lord. What in the world would ever stop us? except our own pride. You heard it today. You heard it today. If you're a family, and that family says, I'm done. And as a family unit, as a family unit, I want to do this. Then I want to speak to the families. And I don't want you to sit there as a family if you're going, you know what? That cross is where we need to be. And today, we're going to pick up our cross as a family, and we're going to do this. Mary, could I have you pray for somebody? I want to make sure, folks, that I don't miss out on anything. Sacrifice. Just sacrifice. Have you come to the point of sacrifice for your walk with Jesus? I would ask you, go there. 
It's where the joy is. I'm going to pray. You're more than welcome to come and pray. Even if some good saints want to come down here and pray for these people right here. I don't want you to necessarily to disrupt them while they're praying. I want you to pray with them. I want them to know that there's somebody here with them. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that we that don't understand but understand today. I pray, Father, that that cross, Lord God, that is there would become so real to us, Lord God, that we would actually, if we have to envision you up there and say, Lord, that place, it looks horrible. It looks, it looks like you're losing the battle. And Lord, for us, it may look like we may lose this battle when we pick up our cross. But once we pick it up, we're going to see a resurrection of that which we have never seen in our lives before. Whether it be the giving of our finance, the giving of our hands, the walking of our feet, whatever, Lord God, that we can do. Maybe it's just praying and maybe it's a sacrifice of praise. But it needs to be a sacrifice, something that's not comfortable to us. Get us out of our comfort, Lord, and bring us to a place where some people are right here, Lord. Lord, for everyone that's up here right now, I ask that the Spirit of God touch their lives hardcore, hardcore. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for the youth today, Lord God. There is a calling, Lord, that you would have for them. It's radical. And it will be a sacrifice that we didn't have to go through because in our day, it was just so acceptable. Today, it's not acceptable in our school system. It's not acceptable to their friends. All the LGBT stuff is acceptable, but Christ is not acceptable. Lord, I pray for a radical, radical salvation, Lord God, today for our youth. Make it happen, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, for the ones, Lord God, involved in their addiction, Lord God. I pray for their families, that their families from now on, Lord God, would pick up that cross and would follow you, Lord God, all the way to sacrifice. Without sacrifice, we're never going to change our community. we got to take it to the edge. We can take business to the edge. We take our life to the edge and so many other things. I pray that we will do it with our salvation and our Christian walk with you. Answer the prayers, Lord God, to all the ones that are here. Bless them. Bless them, Lord God, with righteousness. Bless them, Lord God, with holiness. Bless them, Lord God, with a fire in their bones that they absolutely can't even hold on to. It's bigger than anything they could ever think of. We love you, and we praise you for what you're doing today, Lord. And I pray for all of this congregation right now, Lord God, and I believe you're asking us to pray for these youth that are here right now, for a mighty, mighty anointing to be over their lives, because something radical is going to happen in some of these youth. And I pray that we would have their back. May the church, Lord God, be their family right now. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we would follow through with our part. And we ask it, Lord God, in all sincerity, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. They're praying up here, you guys. I would ask you to please let them pray. God bless you. You're more than welcome to leave. But let them pray if you would. I would appreciate it.